Okay, so we are in the book of Acts. And it's a, it's a great, great book. I think you guys will love, love it. Acts forms a bridge between the four Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, showing how the Apostles carried on Jesus' work, and, provi and it provides a historical background for all the epistles we get from Romans through Revelation. Um, Romans is the book right after the Acts of the Apostles, and Revelation is the end of the New Testament. And the Acts of the Apostles is the second of two New Testament books written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Um, like his Gospel, Acts was a letter written to Luke's friend, Theophilus, and it was written around 63, 62, 63, 64 AD. And let me tell you why I'm going to go into a little bit of the history of how we know that. Most of us, those in the arts, those who aren't in the arts, we all sort of know a guy by the name of William Shakespeare. And we assume and accept that the writings of Shakespeare were written by Shakespeare. Now, we may not all agree who Shakespeare was. <clears throat> There's some controversy over was it one person or two. But generally, we know the time frame in which his plays were written, his dramas, and that they were politically inspired. If you know the politics of the day, you see the politics throughout the plays. And yet, even though we accept the writings as his, the um, manuscripts for those writings that we have are not very, they're not very close to the time of the actual original writings. They're hundreds of years later, as well as the writings of some of the Greek uh, philosophers Plato and all those other guys there are hundreds of years later we have copies manuscripts of the copies that they wrote originally and they're hundreds of years out but nobody questions that your Bible <clears throat> the manuscripts of your Bible are dated within 30 years or less some of them within five years of the time of the events happened the time of Jesus this book was written during the time that these events took place <clears throat> and it was written by an eyewitness his name is Luke so it's right back to the source in fact the manuscripts we have that are not the original we don't have the original book of Acts let me say that right off the bat we do have documents manuscripts of the book of Acts that are copies but they it's only been copied two or three times since the beginning and the earliest copies we have are within about 150 years of the events at longest most of them are 60 30 70 years um, so just keep in mind that this is m as close as any historical manuscript you're going to get your bible um, has manuscripts that go back to the time of the events especially the new testament now <clears throat> how do we know when it was written well we do a lot of research like everybody else pastors could just get up there and blah 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 and tell you things and if you didn't research it yourself or know that there was good research behind it sociological research linguistic research historical research archaeological research if you didn't know what was going on behind it you don't know if your your pastor's blowing smoke up your nose you know so we know that acts ends with the paul being on house arrest in rome waiting to present his case before Caesar. If you don't know why Paul was arrested, you're going to find out as we go through this. Now, several theories have developed over the years as to why, figure out why Luke stopped writing at that point. And the best answer is because Luke wrote his narrative up to the time that the events occurred and then stopped. Luke does not give the results of what happened with Paul's case before Caesar because they had not happened until after he completed the book. The Caesar at the time was Nero, but Nero hadn't gone crazy and started persecuting the church yet. He did that in 64 AD, so we know these events listed in the book of Acts happened before that date. Luke devoted more than half of his book of Acts to Paul's ministry, so it's safe to assume that he would have given us the outcome of the trial and described Paul's subsequent, subsequent ministry when Paul went to Caesar Nero the first time he was released there was no the the arguments against Paul were religious in nature and Rome could care less so they released Paul and he went out and ministered more he eventually wound up or rearrested and, and beheaded but none of that is recorded in the book of Acts um, 
So we assume that Acts was written and finished before his trial um, with the first time he met with um, Caesar Nero. Luke also doesn't record some other things that we know are notable events in the history of the church, like James, who was the head of the Jerusalem church, he was martyred. Luke doesn't record that. And that happened in 62 AD, according to the historians of the time, a guy by the name of Josephus. And so we assume that the things of that were um, not, they hadn't happened yet. So that's why they're not recorded. So we've got this uh, time gap, if you will. And it, again, it helps us date the writing of the book of Acts. The fall of Jerusalem happened in 70 AD. And we know that, um, we know that happened, that's historical. And Luke doesn't record that. So we have to figure out what's, you know, the time of the book of Acts again was written before the fall of Jerusalem because he speaks of Jerusalem in the book of Acts. And we have a real good certainty that he wrote before 64 AD and somewhere between 62, 63 AD. Um, now it's the first written hi history of the church, the book of Acts. It records the initial response to the Great Commission. The Great Commission is given at the end of Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel where Jesus commands that we go out and teach the world about him. That's why it's called the Great Commission. And it, the book of Acts covers a period of about 30 years, gives us information about the early church's existence that isn't anywhere else in the New Testament. And although it's primarily historical and not theological, it does emphasize that Jesus was Israel's long-awaited Messiah, and it shows that the gospel is offered to all men, not merely the Jewish people, and it stresses the work of the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned 50, more than 50 times in the uh, book of Acts. Acts refers to the Old Testament a lot, the prophets, uh, Joel, Psalms, Isaiah, things like that, quite a bit. But we have to keep in mind, it doesn't give us the full history of the church during this period. It specifically deals with certain people. The, word, the book of Acts is the title, but it comes from a heading that's given to the scroll on which it was written, which um, praxis, which is spelled a little different than we use the word praxis. And it was the title given to books written about, it was a genre of books written about the Greek mythological heroes. And so it's written about several specific heroes in the church. Peter takes up well, roughly the first 10 or 11, 12 chapters. His ministry is prominent and the remainder of the book is about Paul. So it's given us a slice of church history during this time. It doesn't record what happened with the churches in Galilee and Samaria. They're barely mentioned and we know they were banging and happening churches at the time. Um, and there was a strong church established in Egypt during this time that's not mentioned at all. So why did Luke even write it? Uh, did he want to get, you know, have a bestseller on Amazon or something like that? Was his purpose ecclesiastical? Like, did he just want to um, encourage the church? Was it apologetic? That is not apologizing, but defending the faith and explaining what was going on. Did he simply write it because he wanted to chronicle the history? Because he, he's a doctor, we know that. Uh, if he wrote it for ecclesiastical purposes, it may have been written in order to edify the church. Uh, the main theological em emphasis is the Holy Spirit. If this book begins with Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit, which we know is going to happen in Pentecost in chapter 2, and it's um, when the Holy Spirit falls on the Jewish believers, and then the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles in chapter 10. If he wrote it as an apologetic, it might have been to make the case that Christianity was not a threat to the Roman Empire, and that it was lawful. It would be lawful because it was a sub-sect of Judaism, which was an approved religion under Roman rule. Not all religions were approved. Acts might have been used in Paul's defense before Caesar because he was going to trial. He had to have somebody stand for him. Luke was always with him. We don't know if Luke was the only one, but Luke was a doctor, so he would have been educated enough to make presentations in court. You didn't have to be an attorney in those days. 
Um, and the Jews had accused the Christians of defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, a guy by the name of Jesus. We, well, we know that uh, that wasn't the case. We do know the church claimed Jesus was a king, but not as a threat to Caesar. In fact, before Jesus ascends, and we'll see this today, Jesus' disciples asked him if he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And that's in verse 6 of the first chapter. And he told them that it was not for them to know the times or the dates that were in his father's authority, but that they would receive power from the Holy Spirit to be as witnesses to the whole world. So it's clear from Jesus' response to their question that he was not sending out his disciples to bring in a new earthly kingdom, but to bear witness to his spiritual kingdom. He, in fact, told this to um, Pontius Pilate. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight. His kingdom was spiritual. So it could have been an apologetic that reason that Luke wrote this book for the sake of keeping Christianity from being wiped out early on. We don't know. Now, Luke was Paul's friend. He's a co-laborer for the Lord. He was a physician, it tells us in the book of Colossians. Uh, history and archaeology tell us that um, Luke was an excellent historian. There were years that people who criticized the Bible criticized the book of Acts because of certain terminology that um, Luke used. He uses a term called strategoi, which is a, um, a title used of temple captains in the book of Luke, in the book of Acts, but it was not found anywhere until the late 1800s, early 1900s. So until then, people thought Luke was just a mythological story with made up words. He uses the word politarch, a word you're probably familiar with, and proto, which are again titles of government officials that were in the Roman Empire. And this was unknown until archaeological discoveries confirmed his accuracy. He frequently uses the first person plural pronouns we and us when he writes throughout this book to indicate that he was an eyewitness. And in this book, and we're going to jump into it now, <clears throat> we'll read how God prepared the church for unhindered mission. God empowered the church for missions to overcome persecution. God is not restricted by cultural barriers, organized opposition, physical barriers, racial barriers, political persecution, human prisons, powerful governments, or geographical boundaries. And we see this throughout the book of Acts, which should encourage us, regardless of what's going on around us. So let's step into the book of Acts, chapter 1. We'll look at the first five verses, then we'll read another few verses, and let's go from there. So look, look at the book of Acts, chapter 1. Verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And so we get the first five verses of the book of Acts. Luke the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. The former treatise is the Gospel of Luke. Turn back to Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 1. And you'll see where we compare Scripture with Scripture and understand what's going on. Luke chapter 1, the first four verses. For as much, for as many have taken, as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things, which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus that you might know the certainty of those things 
wherein thou hast been instructed. And so we see Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, <clears throat> writing to his friend Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? His name means God lover, Theos and Phileo. That's the word, his name. There's not much known about who he was, though. Some of the possibilities are that he was Luke's patron. Doctors in those days in the Roman Empire, many of them were slaves. Um, they were many of them were quacks. There were some who hung out shingles, some who did surgeries in the open air in the public square just to show off their skills to attract more patients. I'm not sure I would have gone to a guy who cut me open in front of everybody. Um, but those doctors were not highly respected in those days, like they are physicians, like they are today. And they didn't get paid much, so many of them had patrons. It could have been that he was Luke's patron. It could be that the name Theophilus was simply used as a reference to all Christians. Um, as Luke was writing to many people, he says in, in his own gospel here that he had perfect understanding. doesn't mean perfect. He knew everything perfectly. It means he had a complete knowledge of the early events of what was going on. And his use of the term most excellent in addressing Theophilus in Luke chapter 1, verse 3, though implies that Theophilus was a governing official, um, because this term was used to address men of prominent rank or office, and every occurrence of it in the New Testament refers to governing officials. We'll see this three times in the book of Acts. If Theophilus was an official, it might not have been his real name. Maybe Luke used the name Theophilus as a pseudonym to protect his friend and his identity because being a Christian was dangerous in the early days. And what he says to him here in Acts chapter 1 is, I'm giving you a Theophilus, the former treatise about what Jesus began to do, the Gospel of Luke. So that's what he started with. And now he's making the second. Imagine what it'd be like, though, if the book of Acts wasn't here in the Bible. You pick up your Bible, we see the ministry of Jesus ending with the Gospel of John, and then next, if there's no book of Acts, we read about a guy named Paul writing to the followers of Jesus in Rome. And we would have a question in our mind like, who is Paul? All, most of what we know about Paul comes from Acts. How did the Gospel get from Jerusalem to Rome? And the book of Acts answers these questions. Because the expansion from Jerusalem to Rome is a remarkable story, especially given the political climate, and the religious politics of the day. Humanly speaking, Christianity had nothing going for it. It didn't have money. It didn't have name recognition leaders, no technology tools for propagating the gospel. It faced enormous obstacles. It was brand new. It was uh, the growth out from Judaism of Messianic Judaism as what we would call it today. <clears throat> it taught truths that were incredible to the unregenerate world that somebody could rise from the dead. It's an amazing thing today. Even. And it was the subject to the most intense hatreds and persecutions early on. If God wasn't protecting Christianity, Christianity would have died. Now, ancient books were typically written on papyrus scrolls. And it was practical to have a scroll that was about 35 feet long. If it got longer, it was too bulky to carry around when it's all rolled up. And this physical limitation is what determined the length of many books in the uh, ancient world, including the books of the Bible. Luke used two scrolls to tell his story. One is the Gospel of Luke, one is the Book of Acts. And Luke completed the work God gave him to do by writing about the unhindered spread of the Gospel from Jerusalem to Rome, from Jew to Gentile, from Jewish culture to Greek culture. And Luke was 84 when he died. He died in Greece in the region of Boeotia. Um, it's not a city. It's in a, like a county a, in somewhere in the central area of uh, Greece. And that's where he died. That's all we know. But he does say, look, I've written to you about the first treatise about all the things that be, Jesus began to do until the day he was taken up, verse 2, after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Jesus' teaching to the disciples after his resurrection and before his ascension were commands, not suggestions. And that includes the Great Commission. If you turn back to Matthew chapter 28, and that's where we'll look at the Great Commission today, just for a second. Matthew chapter 28. And we'll look at verse 19. We're going to look at um, 
several verses. We're going to focus on verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Um, Jesus gives the Great Commission. And it says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The word teach is the Greek word mathetuo. Mathetes means disciples. The word itself, mathetuo, this version of it means both to be a disciple and make a disciple. We are not told to make converts to Christianity. Throughout the Bible, particularly the New Testament, we are told to make disciples. Those are followers of Christ, not just believers in Christ. People who believe enough in their hearts to follow him is what we are commanded to do. And so we teach about Jesus. We don't have to be great teachers. We just teach the story of Jesus and the things Jesus did. As, as Luke says here, the things that Jesus both <clears throat> began to do and to teach is what he shared with Theophilus. And the word of God will do its work in the hearts of people as the Holy Spirit draws their hearts. And some of you all, you probably all know that. You've gone through that process and you didn't understand when your mind and hearts were being expanded to follow Christ. You had this longing in you that maybe hadn't been there in prior years. That was the work of the Holy Ghost in your heart as he was drawing you. And it was the word of God that did its job and, and finished the work to bring you to saving faith, as we call it. So until the day he was taken up, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, Luke tells us, instructed the apostles regarding what to do in his absence, and he gave commandments to the apostles. Now notice that Jesus, Luke tells us Jesus did this through the Holy Spirit. The resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus Christ, risen with all authority and sovereignty, and all power in the world was given to him, <clears throat> chose to rely on the power and the presence of the indwelling of Holy Spirit. And he did that because he was going to go away. And the church would have to learn how to get by without his presence being in their face. He's not here with us physically. He's in heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. But he still works in the world and does his work in us through the work of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, what did that look like to the early church? Well, we're going to read about it. Jesus didn't tell them how it was going to work. He just said, this is what's going to happen. We don't get any answers in the records of Jesus' time prior to his ascension. How did he, through the Holy Spirit, show them things? Well, I suspect impressions on the heart and revelations of his word as it began to explode in their minds, the things he had taught to them. And all of a sudden they understood, oh, that's what he meant. And they, as you read through the Gospels, you see that. We didn't know till after it happened, John wrote, that what he was talking about was this. Yeah, that was the Holy Spirit revealing it to him. And I suspect the Lord was giving them Bible studies like he did when he opened the Old Testament scriptures to the two men he walked with on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection on the original Easter Sunday. So we don't know the details of what it looked like, but we have some idea because as we read through the book of Acts, we see how the Holy Spirit worked through the people and we have that same testimony in our own lives. Because the book of Acts was the beginning. It's not the end. It's the Acts of the Apostles, and the, as it's called, literally just the Acts, and the Acts of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, which is still here, and we're part of it, and he's still working through us. And yeah, we're not Paul or Peter doing those things, but they, we need more Pauls and Peters. We just need more disciples so the rest of the world can be reached because the work will be done by the Lord and the, through his word and the Holy Spirit. So we don't... We don't get a lot of details. But what we do see is this in verse 3. To whom Jesus also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Many infallible proofs. Now this was necessary. We Remember when we were reading through how Jesus appeared to the guys um, in the upper room and they were hiding because they were afraid and... Even when he appeared and told them who he was, they weren't sure. And, and when he appeared just at the end of the book, of, uh, the Gospel of John, 
on the shore. They dared not ask him who he was. Even though they knew who he was, they dared not ask him. There was a lot of misconceptions and fears. The scriptures tell us they thought he was a spirit. Um, when Jesus first appeared, they were normal people like we are. If we knew somebody who you walked with for years and was in, very impacting in our lives, and all of a sudden they rose from the dead, we'd be freaked out too. So Jesus spoke to them and, and showed proofs that this was him. So he said, hey, I'm not a spirit. Give me some food to eat. A spirit can't eat. Touch me. Touch the marks on my body. See that I'm real and I'm physical. I'm flesh. Jesus rode, rose bodily, not in a spiritual manner. And Jesus spoke to them, though, of things pertaining to the, th the kingdom of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Some Gnostic and more liberal teachers, and there are still Gnostics today, tried to persuade us that Jesus used those 40 days to teach his followers strange and obscure doctrines that must be rediscovered with revelations or something even in these modern days. But Luke tells us that Jesus simply taught them much the same things and themes that he had taught them in his earthly ministry, the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, if you were going to leave people who you love, knowing that you would never see them again, uh, and that happened to many of our immigrant families who came from foreign countries, they knew the likelihood of them getting back in those days was small to none because they were on ships and all kinds of slow transportation. And if you were about ready to move away to a foreign country or just someplace where you were going to die and understood that you were not going to see them again, and you wanted to impart to them the most important things on your heart that you knew would have the greatest impact on their future lives, what would you share with them? I trust it wouldn't be about the coolest Facebook memes you've seen recently or the latest Netflix series or even the book that most impacted your life unless it was the Bible. <clears throat> but even then you would tell them to read it, not so much exegete it for them. You might want to share about certain people you want them to avoid for their own safety and so they wouldn't get snookered. But when you're speaking to a large group of people, which Jesus was, he spoke to groups, not, he didn't, we don't have records of him speaking to individuals except in a few cases early on. He may have, we don't know, but we do know that he appeared to groups, including a group of five, more than 500 at one time. When you're speaking to a large group, you must import, impart the most important information that will affect everybody in the group. And Jesus, who is God and who knows what the future holds for everything and everybody, chose to speak of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Why? Because he knew that was the most important thing. And we should take a clue from our Lord. Even though all of us will be affected by politics, that will differ depending on the countries in which we live. But there are some common denominators we all have as human beings as well as believers. Um, each of us has an eternal soul. It's going to go to one of two places, heaven or hell. The choice is ours. <clears throat> Another commonality every human being shares is that unless we are blessed to live when the rapture occurs, each one of us will die. Death awaits us at the end of the life. Our lives are defined by death in many ways. We have what is called a lifespan. It doesn't last forever. It's a, an average. Today, some people are having birthdays. They are a new age. Not the new age, but they are a, an older age. That little hyphen between our birth and death dates on, on tombstones. Uh, comments people make saying, hey, you look pretty good for your age, or other things like that. So death is always in our faces in subtle ways, sometimes not so subtle ways. If we're going to follow the Lord's example, it would be good for us to maintain our focus on the things pertaining to the kingdom of God because that is eternal. And we who believe in Jesus will live there forever. Um, and it will be good for us to know as much about it as we could. Jesus taught about it. 
the New Testament records many things that pertain to our life here that will affect us in our life there, our lives there. And so it's something we should focus on. In verse 4, Luke writes, And being assembled together with them, Jesus, and I'll put in the word Jesus because we're speaking about him from the last verse, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Now, in the last gospel, or the last chapter of Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verses 49 through 53, Luke writes this. And this is Jesus saying, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Acts picks up where Luke's gospel leaves off, recording the early progress of the gospel. As Jesus' disciples took it from Jerusalem throughout Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the Mediterranean world. The story begins with Jesus' ascension and the events of Pentecost. As Gentiles begin responding to the gospel, though, the focus shifts to Paul and his missionary journeys. And here in verse um, 4, Jesus tells them to wait. Don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Not wait for any old thing, or just for the sake of waiting, or just take a rest and recharge your batteries and let all this stuff sink in. No, he said, wait for the promise of God, which is the Holy Ghost. Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. This wasn't a suggestion. <clears throat> Jesus had nothing else for the disciples to do other than to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, which was the promise of the Father. Because he knew that they could do nothing effective for the kingdom of God until the Holy Ghost came. Now Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all mentioned in this verse. Understand that the doctrine of the Trinity or the triunity of God, the Godhead, the, the, tr the word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. But the fact of the Trinity and the concept of it that there is one God and three persons is woven into the fabric of the New Testament. We'll come across it as we study through the rest of the New Testament. And here, the Son of God told of the promise of the Father, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. So we see all three uh, mentioned in this verse, although the doctrine itself is not stated to be as such in this verse. In verse 5, Luke writes, For John truly baptized with water, <clears throat> but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence, or not many days from now. John the Baptist. Jesus mentions John to his disciples, and this is after John has been dead for a few years now, <clears throat> because John was more important, had more social impact, and was more widely known and popular than we typically think. Yeah, he was the forerunner of Jesus. We know his ministry. He baptized people, called the Pharisees vipers and snakes, got beheaded because this, you know, Herod got drunk and he had uh, untoward feelings toward his stepdaughter, things like that. Jesus had this to say about John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's amazing. John didn't do any miracles that we know of. Wow. Jesus, who is God, who cannot lie, makes this amazing assessment of a man coming into the world. That's amazing. The, the God in the flesh would say this about a human being. He was the greatest man born of women, John the Baptist. I, I would like to talk to John. I wonder if he, you know, like we all have stories to tell about our past and sometimes they get embellished. I know they do in my family. <clears throat> I suspect we all have those kinds of embellishments, but I don't think John would be an embellisher. When we get to heaven, I want to know, John, there's details about you not written here. I would really like to know and talk to the people 
Did you see John? What was it like? How was he the greatest? I don't know. We know he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, it says the law and the prophets were until John. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament ended with him. And the New Testament began with Jesus. John was the transition guy. In the spiritual relay race of eternal life, John had handed the baton off to, to Jesus. And Jesus references John in relation to the baptism John provided. Look what he says. John baptized with water, truly, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So he compares the baptism of the Holy Ghost with John's baptism by water. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is being promised by Jesus to people who were already believers and disciples. Think about that. <clears throat> According to many modern church theologies, one cannot be a believer in Jesus without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that is true. So what does Jesus mean when he tells people who are already believers and disciples that they will at some future point, not many days from now, be baptized with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. A lot of modern churches, it seems obvious from Jesus' words, since he's telling it to people who already believe in him, that this baptism of the Holy Ghost about which he speaks is something separate from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that happens when we come to saving faith in Christ. They will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. What's that about? I, <clears throat> I thought they received the Holy Spirit when they became believers in Jesus. Uh, didn't Jesus breathe on them just recently? We read it in John's Gospel so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Well, yes, yes, and yes. So what's Jesus talking about here? Well, he's talking about something that is a separate act of grace apart from salvation. And it's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Many modern-day churches don't believe in this. They say that that's not different. When you believe in Jesus, you receive the Holy Ghost. Well, we believe that. I believe that we do. That happens. But I also believe what Jesus said here, and that the fact that he says it to believers who already are in being indwelt on some level by the Holy Spirit, they will be empowered in a separate way. In chapter 2, we'll read about the day of Pentecost. And on that day we know that the church was birthed as it's called when the holy spirit fell in the form of tongues of fire when 120 people gathered in the upper room they were already believers jesus had already breathed on them uh, to receive the holy ghost <clears throat> at least he breathed on the apostles who were in that room hiding and since jesus cannot lie they did receive the holy ghost that day this baptism of the holy ghost is different and separate from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we get when uh, when we come to saving faith in Christ. So we'll explore it a little more when we get into Acts chapter 2 and we'll study it even more when we get to Paul's epistles but I just want you to know up front that Jesus is the one who said to believers who already had the Holy Spirit, that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Let's get on to verse 6. Let's read verses 6 straight. We'll end with verse 8 today. <clears throat> when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So the disciples asked Jesus a final question. And it's got nothing, it's spiritually, it's okay spiritually, but it's not specifically about spiritual things. And they say, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? <clears throat> now this is, think about it, restore means they're expecting uh, a political and territorial kingdom, because he was talking about the kingdom, <coughs> they were talking about the kingdom, to Israel, they were expecting it to be a national kingdom that had to do with the Jews, at this time, and they were expecting it to happen immediately. 
Now, that's a natural question for Jews in the first century, especially believing Jews. The Old Testament speaks of the future restoration of the kingdom for the Jewish people. They've got Messiah in front of them. He is alive after having been dead. It would make sense to them that this would be the time the kingdom would be restored to the Jewish people. Now, this is a question they'd asked many times before, but because Jesus is now resurrected, it had a special relevance. They knew that Jesus had instituted the new covenant when he did the first communion service that he did at the Last Supper, when he did the Lord's, you know, he said he broke the bread and said, take and eat, this is my body, and drink this wine, this is my blood. He called it, this is the new covenant in my blood. Luke writes about that in Luke chapter 22. They also knew that the restoration of the kingdom of Israel was part of the new covenant. We'll look at that real fast. Uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. We're not going to read all the verses that have to do with it, but we're going to flip through a few verses real quick. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. And I say that so you can refer to it later if you're taking notes. Um, if not, just text me if you ever want to get through it or message me and I'll send them to you. Jeremiah chapter 23. First, uh, the Lord warns the nation of Israel through the prophet Jeremiah that woe to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor and he tells what he's going to do that with them and then in verse 3 he says I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more so he's talking about a future restoration in Ezekiel chapter 36 before the uh, great and powerful day of the Lord, uh, before the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, although they're not necessarily chronological chapter-wise, but in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 16 through 30, the Lord speaks through Ezekiel to the Jewish nation. Moreover, the word of the Lord, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their land, they defiled it, so I drove them out. I poured my fury on them, and I scattered them. But I had pity on my holy name, therefore say, thus saith the Lord, I will not do this. He's going to bring them back. I'm going to bring them back into the land. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. So they would be restored to the land. This goes on in chapter 37, um, where he uh, talks about in verses, in verses 21 through 28. That he will restore them so the restoration is throughout the prophets and in other places it was all part of the new covenant which he had established at the last supper so it would be reasonable for these apostles and these disciples in acts chapter 1 to ask this question and wonder why when the rest of the new covenant would be fulfilled they didn't see the gaps in fulfillment yet in fact uh, bible scholars have a, a, a a name for it, a theological name. It's called mountain vision, real theological, right? But what it is, is you look at a mountain range in the distance and they all look, you know, like they're on the same flat plane. And that's what prophecy looked like to the Old Testament type believers. They saw the mountain peaks with all the prophecies sitting on top of it and they didn't know there was, if you, as you got closer to the mountains, you could see there are miles and miles between those mountains. As you get closer to the fulfillment of prophecy, you see that they're not always fulfilled one right after the other there's time gaps between them and that's why it's called that mountain vision. so they didn't understand that now jesus doesn't rebuke them for or correct them for their question because this is a natural question for them to wonder he simply told them that the answer wasn't for them to know the kingdom will be restored but jesus told them not to worry about earthly things which tells us something because we're living in a time when prophecy is being fulfilled all around us more important than fulfilled prophecy, even though directly from God, is that his children should, by the Holy Ghost, witness of him to the whole world, which he says in verse 8, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, and do, learn about things that pertain to the kingdom of God. That's more important than fulfilled Bible prophecy. Fulfilled Bible prophecy is important. 
I'm not demeaning it. And it's important to us who are living where it's being fulfilled because it's encouraging to us. It tells us that God is still on the throne and he's taking care of things just as he said he would. And that we read the last page and we know we're going to win in the end whatever happens between now and then. Even if we don't want to suffer, we might, but we know we win in the end. So we should be encouraged. And, for, and Jesus' answer to them in verse 7 was, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. <clears throat> it wasn't so much a warning. It's just like, guys, it's not important. The Father's put it in his own power. These are things which belong to the Father alone. Not even Jesus is taking charge of this aspect, the re restoration of the kingdom. God the Father would do that. And Jesus was wise for not outlining his plan over the next 2,000 years. And I say 2,000 years because the kingdom was restored about 2,000 years later. We'll get into that. <clears throat> if the disciples knew that the full restoration of the kingdom of Israel wouldn't happen for approximately 2,000 years, they might be discouraged from the work they had to do right then at that time. They might not have gotten the gospel out and spread all over the world as quickly as they did on foot in most cases. It might make them think less of the aspect of the kingdom of God that's present in them at the time, that's present in us now at this time. The kingdom of God is in us. Jesus said it's in you, it's near you, it's even in you, to those who believe anyway. It might make them be concerned about that and, and like push the aside. Well, I guess that's not a big deal. It's a real big deal. Study the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. But he says in verse 8, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It isn't for us to know the times or the seasons for these first century Jews. But they will receive power. And the receiving of that power will not be delayed. They will get it in a few days. The natural result of receiving the promised power would be that they, you shall be witnesses. They would become witnesses of Jesus all over the earth. This wasn't a command. It's just a simple statement of fact. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you shall be witnesses of me. Shall be, or in the Greek form, are indicative, not imperative. He didn't recommend that they become witnesses. He said they would become witnesses. And this is true for all disciples of Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Our lives are so radically changed once we come to the Lord, it bothers people around us in good and bad ways. Uh, sometimes one, couple, one part of a married couple gets saved and the other one doesn't, and it causes a big conflict in the house. Um, and other times it draws the other to the Lord quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time. Just the people around you, as you change your lifestyle, you're not drinking, you're not cussing, you're not doing all the things you used to do. Your friends are saying, what's the matter with you? Holy Joe, we know what's going on. Can't you hang out with us anymore? You're still hanging out with them. But now they're saying, hey, we can't tell dirty jokes in front of you. Well, you didn't say they didn't have to or couldn't. They just feel funny doing it in front of you because you're, the changes in you. That's a good thing. You are a witness to Christ. And the Holy Ghost empowers believers to fulfill the Great Commission, which we were given. These guys would be uh, witnesses of Christ in Jerusalem, <clears throat> which was their only own backyard. When Jesus rose, ascended into heaven, it happened on the Mount of Olives, Bethany area. Um, so Jerusalem was their backyard, was their hometown, for the church, church-wise speaking, even if it wasn't the hometown in which they were. Born, they were now ministering and serving Christ from Jerusalem. Where do you see the things they do in Jerusalem and the things that happen to them too? Then in their own, that's their own backyard. Then Judea, that's the geographical area around Jerusalem, which was predominantly Jewish, Judea. Then Samaria, which had the Samaritans. It was the adjoining regions of the country, larger, and so included more of their country in which they lived. And then the uttermost part of the earth, foreign missions. They would be that all over. And the progress of the spread of the gospel message from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth is the outline of the book of Acts. The first seven chapters talk about the ministry in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12 speaks of the gospel going to Judea and Samaria. And Acts 38, or 13 through 28 tells us of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. But where does this happen? How does this happen? How did this happen, I should say? Because it happens for us too. 
it means you have to leave the mountaintop. Let me explain. The disciples spent more than three years in Messiah's presence. Then he sent them out from Jerusalem into the world. In which direction did he send them? He didn't say, Peter, you go here. John, you go there. He just filled them with the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost guide them. But where he sent them was out from Jerusalem. The direction out from Jerusalem in the New Testament is always down. Jerusalem is a city built in the mountains of Israel. <clears throat> when we read the gospel accounts of people traveling to Jerusalem, it words it in such a way that it always says they go up to Jerusalem. From wherever you are in Israel, it's always up to Jerusalem. Not because it's the highest location in the country, but because it's the holy city of God. Spiritually speaking, everything in the scriptures is up to Jerusalem. And to go out from Jerusalem means to go down to a lower elevation, spiritually speaking. They had to go down the mountain. So as important as it is to move in a spiritually upward direction, it is equally important to descend from the spiritual mountaintop where we spend time with the Lord. There's an old Christian song written by a guy whose name was Chris Christian, of all things. And the lyrics go, I'd love to live on a mountaintop fellowshipping with the Lord. I'd love to stay on the mountaintop because I love to feel my spirit soar. But I've got to come down from that mountaintop to the people in the valley below or they'll never know that they can go to the mountain of the Lord. And that's always the direction of proper ministry, down the mountain. <clears throat> when we receive from God, um, his blessings, his love, his revelations, the Holy Spirit, his joy, his salvation. It's a spiritual mountaintop for us individually. How many times do we just wish we could bail out from the life in the world and <clears throat> just go sit someplace with Jesus and just be with him and, and soak in his presence and, and learn of his love and know that whatever we've been, he's forgiven. Whatever we are, he accepts and that we are his. But we can't stay there. We're commissioned, the Great Commission. <clears throat> and nor can the blessings of God stay on the mountaintop. God has given us these blessings. He's commissioned us imperfect sinners to share the gospel, the good news, with people who have not yet met the Lord, who have not yet come to the mountain of the Lord. They've not met Jesus yet. So we must go down the mountain. And that's where our ministry is at the bottom. Down from the mountain of the Lord is where the cities and the towns and the marketplaces and the fields and our careers and the rest of the world are located. We have to bring his love to the unloved. We bring his blessings down to the cursed. We bring his riches to the poor. We bring his presence to the godless and his salvation to the lost. Our calling was given in the Great Commission. And the Great Commission begins on the mountaintop. But there's only one place to fulfill it, and that's at the bottom of the mountain. So it's, uh, it's one of those things we just have to do. Now, what's in this for us? Besides that, there's a lot, of course, for us in this. <clears throat> Turn to verse 6 again, since we're there on the same page. It's really hard. And these guys were asking about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Because we live in a day when God's prophecies concerning the end times are being fulfilled... It's important that we understand God's faithfulness in assuring us that the things he said will happen, will happen. So they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, the Jews lived in the country of Israel, but they were not in charge of it. So it wasn't their kingdom. <clears throat> Rome was the governing authority. The Jews today are in charge of their country. When did that change happen? When did the Jews again have the kingdom to re restore to them? <clears throat> well, it happened in 1948. But does that count as having their kingdom restored? Well, I think it does. And we're going to look at that for just a minute. Are you aware of something in the Old Testament um, called the year of Jubilee? Leviticus chapter 25 tells us about it. And in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, it says this, And you shall consecrate the 50th year 
and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. Now, what goes on in the year of Jubilee is, we know that in real life, some people are more financially smart than others. It's not got to do with intellect as much as a knack for finances or getting some education in business. <clears throat> and that's not most of us. I, I am Mr. Bad Businessman. If you want the uh, guy who's the epitome of the bad businessman, I'm it. But I'm a hard worker. I'll work for my money. And here's the deal. The 50th year of the year of Jubilee um, happens to keep the, the nation of Israel intact in their tribal and families together. That's what was meant to happen. If you were a poor businessman like Fran is, and you lived in ancient Israel, if I lived there, <clears throat> it would get to the point where I would have to probably hire myself out to someone or start selling off part of the land I inherited for my family in order to make ends meet, or hire myself out as an indentured servant to another Jew. That's a, that's a form of slavery, <clears throat> but it's willful slavery for a, it's an agreed upon price in order to survive, make a living. But every 50th year, all the land that you sold off would revert back to your family and you would be freed if you were an indentured servant. Now, about 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people lost their homeland, their holy city, Jerusalem, 70 AD, and their ancestral possessions. And um, why that happened was the you know, the city was destroyed because of the Roman uh, occupation. They had rebelled against the, the, the Romans, so Rome came in and smashed them. It happened in 70 AD. But it was prophesied in the Old Testament that they would, and they had lost control of their whole country prior to that. But it was prophesied that they would return to the land. In other words, it would be a prophetic jubilee, a restoration of their ancient possession. Their capital city would be theirs. <clears throat> Could the Jubilee hold the key to the ministry or the mystery of that rest restoration? History tells us that in 1917, in the midst of World War I, the British Empire issued the Balfour Declaration to give the land of Israel to the Jewish people. So the land would re be restored to its original owners. But that didn't include the city of Jerusalem. The Jubilee comes every 50 years. Like I said, it's the 50th year. If we count 50 years from the first restoration in 1917 when the edict was given, it brings us to 1967. It was in 1967 that the holy city Jerusalem was restored to the Jewish people, to its original owners. 50 years. A coincidence? Maybe. But there's more. At the same moment, that Israel was restored to its ancient city, or its ancient city was restored to Israel, the, its ancient capital city, the sign of the Jubilee was manifested. That is, the rabbi who accompanied the soldiers to the Temple Mount there at the end of that war sounded the shofar. And you might be thinking, France, so what? Of course the rabbi would blow the shofar. <clears throat> Do you remember what Jerusalem was before it was the holy city? David had sinned against the Lord. And the Lord told David, I'm going to give you three options for the punishment that's going to happen to your people. You're the king. It's going to happen to your people. You're responsible. And David chose what he thought was the lesser of evils. And when he went and saw this angel of God over in what is now the city of Jerusalem, the holy area of Jerusalem, he saw an angel of God swinging a sword on a piece of land that was belonged to a guy whose name was Ornan, and that piece of land was a threshing floor. It was a flat piece of bedrock on what we call the Temple Mount area today. And that's what Jerusalem was before it was the holy city. It was a threshing floor. Do you know what the Hebrew word translated threshing floor is? It's the word Gorin, G-O-R-E-N. So here's one of those things about God. 
The chief rabbi who accompanied the soldiers to the Temple Mount and sounded the shofar was the chief rabbi of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. His name was Shlomo Gorin. You still think it was a coincidence? Well, maybe. Do you know when Rabbi Gorin was born? He was born in 1917, the year of the first restoration, the first jubilee. So he who sounded the shofar of Israel's jubilee, the 50th year, was himself 50 years old, and his name was Gorin, the name of the threshing floor, the living sign of the jubilee. Our God is amazing. He is the God of restoration. It all happened in the exact place in God's perfect time. He keeps his promises. He also promised that Jesus will return. Now, we don't know the day or the hour, just like the apostles didn't know the day or the hour of the restoration. But the restoration happened, so we can be certain that Jesus will return. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is to see all these things in your word that are just so amazing, that encourage